Apologies to the Historic Society here in Hebron. We're glad to see you, and I think we are going to have a really good program tonight. Um, would you all join me in standing to pledge allegiance to our flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, literature on the uh, desk back there. Um, those are all free for the having if you would like any of them. And we do have uh, an extra little book. Let's see, I'll call it down in the bowl or up in the bowl. Down in the bowl. The bowl is a schoolhouse that we have here. And it's got some nice old fashioned recipes in it. Um, so without making you wait any longer, um, we have our own Mary Ellen Gonsi here, and she's going to start with part one of the connection between uh, the Honorable Judge Gilbert family and the American uh, School for the Deaf. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Thank you. I'm so glad that all of you are here. This is just really an exciting evening tonight. Um, Little did I know when I started cleaning gravestones in 2015 that I would be standing here telling you about the gravestones. And I think that when you look at a gravestone in an old cemetery, you see them leaning and falling down and things like that. Well, that's what we're trying to fix up. And in the process, we decided that we needed to look at the biographies of each of the people who were buried in the cemetery. So one of the ladies who's been working with me to clean the stones went through, and we we now have over 400 biographies for the people who are buried in the cemetery. And I've got a small poster on the, the right side that kind of shows you a little bit of the work that we were doing. When we found the stone for the Honorable Sylvester Gilbert, it was quite an accomplishment, and it was an eye-opener because we learned that Sylvester Gilbert was not only an attorney here in town, he um, was a judge, he was a teacher. He actually had a law school in his office, and we have a record of 56 students who attended that law school here in Hebron. And the most unlikely place the records were found was in the records of Benjamin Pomeroy. And if anybody knows Benjamin Pomeroy in town, they know he's the minister of the First Congregational Church here. He had the records of all the students that were in the school, and he had some of the curriculum. He had the curriculum, he had the lectures. All of those things are now filed at the Yale Law School Library. So Hebron has spread its wings, I think. Um, Sylvester Gilbert had 13 children. We learned that five were, born, were deaf. The first one was Samuel, and Samuel apparently became deaf when he was about two years old. We weren't sure whether, you know, when you look at a, a group of people, is this genetic deafness, is this illness deafness, what's, what's going on here? We learned that Samuel was illness. Um, it may be that the others are genetic, but we don't know that for sure. And I got crazy and I started researching the children, Sylvester's children and their grandchildren, and then got down into the great-grandchildren, trying to find a genetic link that might connect them. And the only child I found in the great-grandchildren end was a 19-month-old. And his gravestone told me he was deaf. So as we cleaned the gravestone, it said, though born deaf, was a, a red flag to me. So it leads me to believe that there is some genetic deafness in that part of the family. And then I went further and cleaned a few more stones and found Levi Bacchus. And Levi Bacchus was the son of Jabez Bacchus, who is buried in the cemetery. We're talking about the cemetery on Wall Street, um, out past the high school. Um, 
and his father was Ezra Bacchus. Levi and Ezra were, I mean, Ezra and Jabez were both buried in the cemetery with a lot of their family. Levi was deaf, and he was uh, fortunate enough to get into the American School for the Deaf when it was first opening. Um, four of Sylvester Gilbert's children were not allowed, were not able to get into that school because it began after they um, were adults. But Mary, who was Sylvester's youngest daughter, was able to get into the school. And then a little further, we found the gravestone of Royal Thomas Colick. Royal Thomas Colick turned out to be a student at the American School for the Deaf also. And he married Polly Cleveland, who was a student at the school. And both Royal and Polly came to Heber and started to live and work in Heber. Royal was a tailor, which I found really incredible because the man couldn't hear. And he was teaching how to make clothing, but he could barely see because he had an infection in one eye and a gradual decreasing in the vision in the other eye. So he could barely see and he couldn't hear. And he was a tailor. And he was teaching the other students how to be a tailor. Um, Sylvester Gilbert's oldest son was Samuel. I mentioned him already. He became a silversmith, silversmith and goldsmith, and made silverware here in town. And in the book on the sewing machine on the left, it says Connecticut Silver. I learned that his sign, is his mark, is in the book. And there were four other deaf, four other silversmiths in town. So he had a lot of competition in making silver. Um, then we had William Pitt Gilbert. William Pitt Gilbert is the son, I mean, a brother to Samuel. He's deaf also. And we are fortunate to have his, he's a cabinet maker. He has the lathe over on that side of the room. It's the one with the big circle on it. And we set it up along the workbench so you could kind of see if you were in a colonial carpentry shop how the workbench and the lathe would work together. And then one of his pieces of furniture oh, is right there in the front of the, the stage. It's a small dressing table. So that one was actually made by William Pitt Gilbert. Um, then we have Lewis. Lewis was the brother of William Pitt and Sally and um, Samuel. Lewis was a farmer and he had six children. He and his wife took care of the kids. Again, he was deaf. Then Clarissa, Clarissa married Ebenezer Force. Ebenezer Force happened to be one of the students in Sylvester Gilbert's school. Sylvester must have been pretty proud. Out of the, the 56 students who were in his law school, <coughs> three of them married his daughters. And then Mary, who was the youngest of the group, uh, went to the school for the deaf. She did not get an occupation, but at that point, most women didn't work outside of the home, so that was not unusual. Um, but I am just thrilled to have Jean Linderman and Brad Mosley here to talk to us about the school and all of the advances that were made in the school and in education of the deaf. So I'd like to introduce them to you. Thank you, Mary Ellen. I'm Jean Winterman. And Brad Mosley. We're from ASD's Museum, and I manage ASD's Museum. Brad did until he recently retired. Now he's our historian. So that's why we tag team tonight. Mm -hmm. Managing the museum is one thing, but a historian, it doesn't make a historian. So that's why Brad's here. Um, Thank you so much, Mary Ellen, for asking us here tonight. I was so excited when you called this summer and talked to me about this collaboration. And the reason was, it's very unusual um, in a collaborative effort like this when we're talking about students from the earliest days of the school to actually have some artifacts to bring. So that we actually had files and some work 
of a Levi Bacchus and a letter from uh, Mary Gilbert's first year at the school. Brad will explain, um, you know, you look at the letter and it looks like, you know, it's crude, but you need to understand the challenges that not only the students overcame to achieve a letter something like this in their first year, but also the teachers when they began the school and had literally nothing, no tools to teach deaf uh, individuals. They had to create, um, they were creating a language, building a school, and also um, items, you know, books, textbooks, learning materials for the students. So they're all making this up as they went, with good guidance, of course, with Lauren Claire on staff. Um, so uh, Brad will talk to you a little bit about the history of our school, and uh, also he'll talk to you a little bit about the curriculum and the development of our curriculum. And we're gonna focus primarily on those earliest years, 18, 20, 30 in there. And then together we'll uh, help you understand some of the work that um, these young people accomplished. Well, I mean young people, I don't mean children, because one of our first students was over 50 years old. You know, there was no competition for the American School for the Deaf when it was instituted in 1817. It's not like children or grown-ups had an alternative. This was it. And um, as a result, after our first and second year, we let our teachers and principals out to other states so they could develop all the schools for the deaf. We were not the least bit territorial about um, our individuals. The idea was to grow education for the deaf. So, um, I forgot want... to add at one point though, Levi Bacchus, when he finished the school here in, in Hartford, um, went to New York and yes. became a teacher in the Canada Hardy School for the Deaf, which was in New York. He was there from 1831 until 1836. Yes. And at that point, the school closed, and he made sure that all of his students had a place in the New York School for the Deaf. And then he ended up marrying one of the students. <laughs> Common. So did our founders. It's OK. <laughs> After they graduated. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I had to add that one. No, no. Leave that out of the Yeah, right. Brad, I'll give you a background. I'm starting to sweat already now. <laughs> Thank you again for uh, asking us here. It's a real honor to represent our early students in our I'm school's so history. Ready. And we're very proud also to have some of our alumni here as well. If it weren't for our alumni, we wouldn't have much of a history or a museum. So, thank you. Brad? Okay. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting us. Uh, it's a, a real pleasure. And, uh, okay, uh, it's a real pleasure. <laughs> Normally I'd be signing at the same time that I speak, um, but we have an interpreter. Uh, one of the things I wanted to add, we do have, uh, Samuel Gilbert's Silver Spoons, and they're right there. That's it, also in our museum. Uh, our school was, uh, how did we start? Well, they took a poll uh, from the Congregational Church, and there was a council, and uh, they, through the different churches uh, throughout Connecticut, uh, they found that there were roughly about 87 uh, school-age deaf children. And so because of that, they had the data to bring back and to see that it was a plausible to, to have a school for the deaf. Um, and then from there, uh, uh, there were 10 benefactors that met at Dr. Coxwell, Mason Fitch Coxwell, prominent uh, physician and surgeon in Hartford, along with uh, Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet, a minister. And uh, these people discussed the uh, necessity to have a, a school for the deaf. Uh, during that time period in the early 1800s was a, a time of uh, what they called the Second Great Awakening. It was a Protestant movement by which all people had to read and understand the Bible. And so if they did not, then they were labeled as savages, uh, idiots, and all that. 
and that was a, a common term used at that time period. And so Dr. Cogswell, who had a deaf daughter, Alice, uh, he wanted her, when she died, to be able to enter the gates of heaven. So uh, it was a big uh, incentive for him to establish or to help establish a school for the deaf. And so therefore, all that people could go and enter the, the gates of heaven. So having said that, the, the, the 10 benefactors sent Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet to, to Europe. Uh, and first of all, he went to England and uh, it was an oral school, and the Bravewoods uh, family had a monopoly and decided that they weren't going to help Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet because uh, they wanted their money up front. Uh, it was for profit, uh, and so it was a no-go. And then Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet saw a demonstration by the French school in Paris with the Abbe Sicard and the Montclair and with uh, Jean Massou. And what they would do, they would write on a piece of paper a question, and then on stage they would have a, a blackboard, and they would uh, uh, write the question down and then respond in writing. And everybody was like, deaf people can read, deaf people can write, deaf people can understand. Oh, mon dieu. So I want to see the interpreter could do that. Mon dieu. Oh. <laughs> My God. So I thought I was going to pull one on her. We go back a long time. Uh, so anyway, uh, the Abbe Sicard uh, met with Gallaudet and invited him to, to Paris to learn the methodologies and signs needed to establish the school. So Gallaudet went and he stayed for a period of time, but it was so overwhelming, he asked Laurent Claire, one of the, the tutor teachers, uh, to join him to America to help establish the school. Gallaudet being who he was, uh, wrote a letter in French, he was fluent in French, uh, wrote a letter to Laurent Claire's mom asking permission for her son to join him in America to help open up the school. And of course she was like, oh, and she agreed. Uh, Laurent Claire uh, went to uh, America with Gallaudet Gallaudet was teaching him English on the trip home, and uh, Laurent Claire was teaching him French Sign Language. So our origins in American Sign Language has the French Sign Language component, and uh, there are some signs that are exactly the same thing as in French. So just let y'all know, it kind of a little bit of trivia. So they established, uh, they went and did demonstrations to, to get money to support the school, and with that, um, they, uh, it, we opened our doors in 1817. One year prior to that, the Connecticut legislature donated $5,000 for the opening of the school. So it was the first state uh, funded uh, monies to support special education. And uh, so that was really, really neat. James Monroe, when the, the school opened up uh, in April. Uh, in July, James Monroe uh, took a, a, a tour of the uh, New England states and stopped in Hartford and ironically for an hour and a half, spoke to Gallaudet and uh, was speaking French uh, to uh, Laurent Claire. And I don't know if uh, this was like in talk or if it was in writing, but uh, it was very exciting that the President of the United States saw the, the first school. The first school was, uh, if you know Hartford, if you go across the street from the Wadsworth Anthenaeum, uh, it's got Bushnell Towers. That location was City Hotel, in which the, the school rented on the second floor three rooms. And that was the first school for the deaf. It, you would know it's in a hotel, you know. So uh, three students opened it up, and by the end of the week, there were seven. By the end of two weeks, there were 22, no room in the inn. So ironically, if you go in back of the Wadsworth Anthony, you had Dr. Coxwell's home, his neighbor was uh, Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet, and then the next door neighbor was uh, Dr. Day, who had just recently passed, and his wife said to Gallaudet, 
why don't you rent the second and third story of my house? And that way it could be used for classrooms or whatever. So uh, the kids would use that as classrooms, but also to eat and sleep. And that's an ASD, original sign for home. You would eat and sleep. And it became modified from eat and sleep to home. So that's an ASD original sign. Uh, so let's see. That's oh curriculum. The curriculum at the beginning stages of uh, the, the Connecticut Asylum for the Instruction and Education of Deaf and Dumb Persons later on became the American Asylum. Uh, the curriculum was vital. For about four years, eat, drink, and sleep, the Bible. Students had to, to understand the Bible, had to learn the Bible, had to write the scriptures, and all that stuff. Later on, you had prominent uh, families that said, well, you're not preparing my child for future life. So how are they going to support a family? So that's when the curriculum changed, and they added wood shop, in which, if you notice over here, we brought in an example of 1830. Uh, students made this. It's a, a sewing box, woman's sewing box. And uh, on Saturday, uh, and went back to even uh, embroidery and, and all that sewing, uh, the students on Saturday would open up, quote, the student store and would sell their products that they made at school. So the, the boys did a lot of woodworking, shoemaking, and later on metal work and would sell it on Saturdays. Half of the money would go to the person, half of the money would go back to the vocational department to expand, to buy equipment and all that. The girls would make jams, jellies, and embroidery work. And we also have a napkin to, to show you what kind of the work that they did here. Uh, and so they would sell that as well. Uh, again, like what uh, Mary Ellen was talking about before, the girls really didn't have a quote, quote, job or vocational thing. They would do cooking and sewing and domestics. And so, and would, some of them became uh, teachers. Thank you. I have my, my cue cards over here, she's <laughs> uh, So anyway, so it's really nice to, to know sign language. Uh, so, uh, in the early years, uh, again, it was just religion, and then they started to change. They, they added geography, history, mathematics, uh, science, um, vocational classes. Uh, later on, they even added sports, and so that was a, a big biggie. And, um, let's see. Oh, and then they also had art, just as an aside. The person who designed uh, Bushnell Park, uh, Jacob Wilderman, anyway, he also taught at the American Asylum, and he taught art. And so I brought examples of, from my own collection, different pieces of artwork. Uh, and you have Augustus Fuller, James Whitcomb, uh, who also did the silhouettes, and then you have H. H. Moore, the two paintings in the front. Students would, uh, would come to the asylum probably, uh, it depended on the family, but usually for a year. Uh, one of the things we have framed, and it was too large to bring, but it was a, a list of what a parent, uh, the clothing items in the trunk. When the kid came to the asylum, they would have a list of all the clothing articles, parasols, and you name it, they had it. And the, the mom would have to list all of the items, and, uh, which is really, really neat. So, uh, but the, the students would uh, get up early in the morning. They always had chores to do. Um, and when they moved to Hartford, uh, or the American school at Hartford for the deaf, uh, it was interesting because what they did was uh, they had big size, they had horses, they had a barn and all that stuff. Uh, and they all had responsibilities and duties. Even one of the first deaf-blind students, Julie Brace, who came to our school, 
she also had duties as well. And uh, so uh, it was just interesting. Everybody helped each other, you know. And uh, so, help me out here. I, it's like curri early curriculum. The curriculum changed as times changed. So that was one of the strong points of our school and why it lasted as long as it, it has. Uh, we were not the first school for the deaf. We we're the first permanent school for the deaf. The first school was an oral school in Virginia. Uh, and many people think that ASD is the first one. We're not, we're the second. But the first one closed down because the, the person who established that was arrested for alcoholism and all that stuff and the school shortly closed. About five, year, uh, five months later, ASD was established. And so we're classified as the first permanent school. So just clear the record. Uh, so, uh, now wait a minute, I gotta ask. Uh, alumni, did you know that? You didn't know that? About the first school? No. Yeah. I think one of the things we are talking about, um, the curriculum. Yeah. And the kids had, you know, religion was number first in the subjects. And when the, um, they have religion classes three times a day. You start in the morning, and then midday, and of course every day. So religion was three times a day. And one of the things we found out, we have Alice Cogswell's file from the school. It's really cool. And just last spring, we got an offer from a family from one of our first students, one of all, uh, Alice's classmates, and excuse me, I'm gonna walk in front of you, excuse me. Um, her name was Eliza Morrison, and the family contacted us and asked us if we'd be interested in purchasing her Bible. We got the Bible and compared it to Alice Cogswell's, it's identical. Yeah. And it's from the Hartford Publishing Company. And what we uh, figured was that since, the, you know, the likelihood of a young person, anybody, who could read to own it in their own Bible was small to zero. But and to, they, excuse me, and also to own books. That's right. If they couldn't read them, why would they? And that they were both identical led us to believe, we can't say it for certainty, but we're pretty sure, because both Bibles are identical, that this is a volume that the school handed out to all of the new admissions. When they came, they were given a Bible. So they were all going to read. And by the way, anything up here, look through it. It's meant to be picked up, touched, and looked at. So please, well, have you seen this Bible? I had. Awesome. <clears throat> we also have a couple other things. Our students kept notebooks. We have Alice Cogswell's catechism notebook. I want you to look at this later on and walk through carefully and look at the handwriting. How beautiful it is. And I was telling Jean earlier, handwriting was extremely important because it was a class uh, a person's writing or the, their penmanship uh, showed that they were with class or educated. Uh, a person with a, a bad handwriting meant, you, number one, you didn't have the training. Number two, your family was probably extremely poor and you weren't educated. So that's also a, an important element in that because a lot of the early um, documents we have and letters and all that stuff, beautiful handwriting, beautiful. And they really did uh, do a lot of work with penmanship. They did, they did. And we have books of um, handwriting, penmanship classes, penmanship for girls and penmanship for boys. They were different, they were different. Girls were expected to have more of a flourish Boys are supposed to be much stronger. Blunt. Yep.
we had to, our founders had to create a lot of their own textbooks. We didn't have, it wasn't like they could start school and go to a book binder and order books on how to teach deaf individuals. So our founder, Thomas Gallaudet, there were some, of course, in Europe, but here in America, we could get books on instruction for the deaf. And Gallaudet wrote our first series of books. This is one of them. It's a child of the soul. Not surprising. He's a minister. So you can look through these as well. Oh, I'd like to add something when sure. you said minister. The American School recognizes three individuals who were very important to the founding of our school. One was Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet, who had colonial roots and was also a minister during this time period of the Second Great Awakening. Then you had Dr. Mason Fitch Cogswell, prominent surgeon, doctor in Hartford, and he brought influence and money. He knew the President of the United States. He knew everybody. I mean, hello. And then the third thing was Laurent Claire, who was a teacher in Paris who came to uh, America, and he brought communication. These three people are the founders of ASD. If one was not present, it would have never happened. You had to have communication with Laurent Claire. You had to have uh, influence and money. So you had to have Dr. Uh, Cogswell. And you also, during that time period, the Second Great Awakening, it was important to have a minister, but also colonial roots. People would believe you. Because if somebody from a, another place would come in, I wouldn't trust them. You know? So th those three elements were very, very important. We spoke earlier about Mary Gilbert's letter, which is here. We have a transcription for you as well. We love this connection, Mary Ellen. We really love this connection that you um, want her for us. And of course, Levi Bagus. Levi, by the way, was um, uh, from our uh, alumni Hall of Fame. He was uh, awarded a, uh, we have his, his trophy here last year, 2018. So he was noted. We also have the, our admissions book that has Mary and Levi's uh, name, where they were born, their parents, uh, how they became deaf, did they have any brothers and sisters who were, were hearing impaired or deaf. And please uh, take a, a look at it because it's really, really interesting. The admissions book is here. It has Royal College. And um, Darlene, one of our alumni here, Darlene Borsati, you have a long history in the town, too. Right? Yeah, but that was it from jail. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you walked into the post office and it said, wanted. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> I know I shouldn't have brought my notes. <laughs> so, um, and the, the other interesting thing, when we had our 200, um, anniversary in 2017. We uh, arranged our exhibit through the Connecticut Historical Society. Um, you know, they, they, they had the room for it, of course, the professionals, and we had never done an exhibit on the scale before. So the Connecticut Historical Society guided us through the preparation of that exhibit. What a fascinating couple of years that was. Mm -hmm. And they came in to look through our archives of what they thought would be the most interesting uh, things to put on display. And at first I thought, I was a little skeptical because I thought, here's this small group of people, they have, they're not versed in deaf history at all and they're going to make these selections. And, but it could have been a better team, and that was exactly what we did want, because they wanted to appeal to a cross-section of an audience. Not, you know, the idea when you look at it from 
just deaf history, it's it's not as broad of a display sometimes. You get a little, you get a little too fun, a little too finite. They did a wonderful job on our display. And one of the things they picked out, I was surprised at some of the things they picked up. Really, want that? One of the things they picked up was this letter here from George Lauren, a classmate of Mary Gilbert's, George Lauren, and um, was well to do from a well to do family in Boston. And this is one of his first letters that he ever wrote. But at the bottom, it's got a lot of notations from Thomas Gallaudet. In other words, every Sunday night, our students were required to write a poem. Remember, the students would pack their bags and come here for a four-year program. Most would be here for the entirety of the year, especially if they were out of state. Travel was long, expensive, dangerous. So they'd stay for the entire year. Some stayed for the entire term of four years without going home. So every Sunday night, our students had to write home to their parents two reasons, to tell their parents how they were doing, but it was also for the parents to have some insight on how their child was progressing. So that was the whole purpose of letter writing on Sunday nights. And this is one of George's letters home, or his first letters home, to his parents. And it's very difficult to understand, he's trying to learn uh, grammar, syntax. So a lot of things are juxtaposed. So you have Thomas Gallaudet's notes on the bottom. Pick it up and look at it if you can't read it from a distance. It's, 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 it's a really neat document. So one of the things before I hand back over to you, one of the things I wanted to let you know is on the table in the back, we brought some books, a pile of books. Um, please help yourself to one of those books. What happened was when we took down our old school in 2012, we had to clear it out because of, we need to go through asbestos removal. In the process, they found these cartons of these old books from about 1900. And they were most of them were reprints, but they were long forgotten cartons of textbooks for our grammar classes, grammar school classes. Which English. teachers developed. And they, these books help yourself to want a good life. These books uh, were printed in our print shop. They were written by our teachers. Printed in our print shop, bound in our print shop. All the photos you'll see in those are of our students, staff, and the old Hartford campus down on Asylum Street. You all know Asylum Street was named after the school. Yes. Yes. Named after the American Asylum. So that's what those books are. It was a really neat find. We're glad to have snacks of them because we're so much fun to hand out. It's far too much in 2017. <coughs> if you remember what she was just saying, you will see a statue on Asylum Avenue and Farmington Avenue in Hartford. And this is the, the founder's statue, Alice Cogswell, and in standing in the hands, each finger represents the 10 benefactors at the meeting to establish the school for the deaf. So it went really, it's a beautiful uh, monument. Uh, it was uh, uh, sculpted by Francis Wadsworth, and it's called the Founder Statue, and Alice is holding a book near her heart because education was very, very important. You see her knee is kind of like pushed forward, uh, and that denotes that with education, Deaf people can be successful uh, and have a good future. You'll also see at the very base uh, a quill pen and a book, and it's at her feet. And that to represent without education, deaf people would still be in darkness. So it's a beautiful monument. Uh, and if you go to Hartford, Farmington Avenue, and uh, Asylum, you will, uh, not Hartford, uh, Farmington, and Asylum Avenues, you will see that. And that triangle where it's on, it's called Gallaudet Park. And you see Cogswell Street, uh, that was Dr. Cogswell and Alice. You see Garden Street, that was because of the, the gardens at the asylum. 
Uh, and uh, then you have Asylum Street, again, the, the Asylum Street, the, the deaf school. But if you look at this inscription up here, this is a, a sewing box uh, from 1830. And it was uh, Eliza Claps, C-L-A-P-P-S. And her husband was a New Hampshire state senator. And uh, anyway, uh, they came on the Saturday and they went to the wood shop and she purchased this sewing box. It's quite beautiful. And she inscribed it. It was made by the deaf mutes at the American Asylum, 1830. Does anyone have any questions? Brad, what, what was tuition? Well, it really kind of varied because the, it, it, excuse me, uh, some of the, the towns would, would pay for it. Some of it was with private funds. We did have our early student, uh, and she was from New Orleans. Her uncle was in the slave trade. Uh, and so he, he uh, paid her tuition and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of it was from towns. Uh, a lot of it, uh, some of it also came from individuals who were wealthy and supported uh, deaf children. So it all varied. And then later on, the, the states took over. But what's interesting, uh, our first, it, it was called the mixture of African blood, it was in 1825 from Nantucket. And that was Charles Hiller. And uh, so his father was in the whaling industry. And, uh, so that was our first quote, quote, African. Uh, even though the, the state of Connecticut passed the Black Law in 1833 to around 1838, for about five years, ASD still accepted uh, Africans and, and black children. Uh, and the reason why nothing ever happened at our school was because, again, the people looked at children going to the deaf school because of this religious second grade awakening. So it was a means by which the kids could go to heaven. So uh, though businesses were being burnt and people were getting beaten up and everything, nothing ever happened to the asylum because of that fact. So uh, any other questions? Japanese 
sign language to Japanese, from Japanese, then it came to English. I responded, went back to Japanese, went back to Japanese sign language. After the six hours, let me tell you, I, oh Lord, I felt like I lost 15 pounds. It was just overwhelming, but it was so, so exciting because it was like a mini UN, you know? So uh, it was a lot of fun. We've had people at, from our museum uh, that came from all over the world, literally all over the world. And uh, it's exciting because people are excited when they find out, you mean there's a museum? And it's with deafness? It, well, sure, yeah, hello. You know. But it, 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 our collections mainly focus in on ASD, but I've made it a point to include a lot of other schools for the deaf as well as oral schools, because when the, the Mystic Oral School closed in 1980, we have quite a bit of their archive housed in our museum. Because at the end of the day, if you take off your hearing aids, you're still deaf. I don't care the methodology, you know. So uh, the thing is, it, it's got to, that history has to be preserved. And when you were talking about the grave sites, I was, my insides were shaking, because ASD, I give tours in Hartford, downtown Hartford, as well as three cemetery tours, uh, and it's all deaf related. Uh, right before the Civil War, there's an epidemic in Hartford of whooping cough, uh, dysentery, and scarlet fever. 25 students from the asylum died. And so they had in Old North Cemetery in Hartford, there's a big, uh, Huh? Obelisk? Uh, yeah, thank you. Obelisk. See, that I always think obelisk Egyptian. No, okay. Anyway, an obelisk. But inscribed on the top of it has asylum. And so you have all the names on all four sides of the person's name, where they were from. Many of them were from the, the, the South and from Carolina, Vermont, and all that stuff. And when they died, uh, you know, they couldn't be necessarily transported. Uh, their bodies transported home, so uh, ASC purchased plots for them, and so they're all, and the, the first time I ever went there was in 1980 when I first arrived from Texas, and uh, I had goosebumps upon goosebumps upon goosebumps because I never knew what a foot marker was, and I'm like, they're awfully small. That's where their feet are. <laughs> uh, and then I, I saw this little chapel thing that had broad arm gates, and I'm like, well, where's the stained glass? Oh, that's so sweet. You can, you know, say a prayer or something. No, Brad. And I'm going, well, what's it for? He said, look. And I'm like, oh, my, what is that? And it was like slate shelving. And it's like, what's this for? And he's like, well, because in New England, the ground freezes. Uh, and so we place bodies in their caskets on the shelf. I, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I love Halloween, but when it comes to flesh like that, uh -uh, I don't do that either. So uh, yeah, it was a learning experience. But you know, I've been here since 1980. And let me tell you, I've been so excited and so lucky uh, because it was my destiny to be up in, in the north, and I'm the southern, you know, so, yeah. Brad, can I add one comment? Please. Um, as far as educating the deaf is concerned, it, it just boggles my mind that Samuel, William Pitt, Lewis, and Clarissa were able to learn anything with just their family. And for Samuel to become a silversmith and for William Pitt to become a cabinet maker, Samuel's son actually was a cabinet maker. And he opened a furniture store. He sold his own furniture in the furniture store. And I'm sure he took William Pitt's furniture and did the same. And then for Lewis to own a, a farm, and when I read through his will, he was not um, poor. He was not destitute. He had all of the basics he needed to, for his life and for his children. It, it just amazes me that without the education they did very well, and I'm sure it was because Sylvester was their father. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was, that, you know, for parents.
parents to finally, for the first time in their life, to feel that my kid is prepared for the real world uh, and that they have a job that they can support a family and all that, uh, you know, and that's the reason why, again, ASD is still standing, is because we've made modifications with the times, and, you know, I taught for many, many years with this woman over here, and I call her Fifi with the hair. Uh, you know, I always called her my French poodle. Uh, and, you know, we taught deaf with special needs for many, many years and opened up our own program. And, uh, you know, we saw. And he's crazy. <laughs> Not really. But, uh, you know, the thing is, it, it, for us in teaching, it was to see the little accomplishments kids did and could accomplish. And when a student makes bounds, a leaps and bounds in their education, oh my God, you go to a graduation, not a drive. Yeah, I used to work at New England Children's Hospital, oh, and right. I used Hello. to work, you know, see the kids with their crutches and wheelchairs and, and everything, and then I went to the beach, and there were none on the beach, and now I see them on the beach all the time, but why are they isolated in the hospital? They should be out with everybody, yeah. and they didn't know anything about how poor they are, how bad, you know, people felt for them. They just were kids, and they did and it, it's also interesting when you say, you say kids, because when a lot of kids, if, for example, we had delegations from Paris, we had delegations from uh, Russia, Moscow, and all that stuff, and the Russians, when they came and all that, it's forbidden to use sign language from their program. It was a oral school. However, the dormitory person that came with the two kids her parents were deaf and they signed. So, but their signs are like, like real close because they don't want people to see that they're using sign language. And at ASD, it's like, oh, <laughs> you know, and it's like, what a big difference. And they couldn't get over. It was culture shock, you know. And so, what what I always like to tell the uh, hearing audience, it's really neat when you stop off at a red light and you're looking in your rear view mirror and a deaf person's in the back and you're signing away and you can have a conversation between the two. And it's like, this is really me. And everybody's like, are they having a seizure? You know, it's one of those. So it, it's really neat. Yeah. For, for those people who aren't familiar, can you explain the whole idea behind the deaf, uh, or the oral school, like how it's different? Oh. Schools, I think that's a huge differentiation a lot of people might not know. Yeah. Uh, there are two main philosophies uh, in deaf education. One is the oral method, where there is no sign language at all, and people read lips and communicate like this all the time. And so lip reading is problematic for many people. Uh, and so it's easier on the eyes when you do this, because uh, it's it, it, it just is, you know. But you have the, the people that were supported by Alexander Graham Bell, who had a hearing impaired wife, who supported oral schools. So if you go like to Northampton at the Clark School for the Deaf, uh, Clark and the American School for the Deaf were always rivals. However, many of the graduates from Clark and many of the graduates from ASD got married. <laughs> So, and, you, yeah, it was and they signed. Huh? And they signed. Yeah, and they signed. Yeah. So, uh, it, I went to a meeting when I first got into Connecticut. And it was Teachers of the Deaf. Uh, hey, I'm all for it. The only thing was, you had the people from the oral school lined up right here, or seated. You had about three or four rows that were vacant. And then over here, you had all the signers all over on this side. And I'm like, excuse me, what the hell is this? <laughs> and I'm like, what is this? You know? And because of philosophy. And I'm like, but you teach deaf kids. We teach deaf.
deaf kids, there's got to be some kind of common ground. No. And it was because they were so adamant. Their, their way is always the way. My thing is, I don't care. You know, I, with some of the kids that I've taught, I use voice only. I did not use sign language. For some kids, I would sign only. For some kids, I would use what they call simultaneous communication. I would sign and talk at the same time. It depends on the individual kids. And that's one of the things that I don't understand that group didn't get. And I think for the most part, whatever works for the kid. You know, but if you're so focused in on, on one track, we got a lot of the oral failures. And the first thing that we had to do was to boost their self-esteem. Now, isn't that sad? Yes. So, you know, time and time again, you would always get that. And, you know, God, I, I worked in the museum with Gene, and the first thing that I noticed, self-esteem was really down. And I had to boost her up, and now she's taking over the museum, <laughs> and I can't stop her. <laughs> so, but anyway, did that kind of answer it? I'm like, you know, there was a big conference in 18, okay, she's looking at time. Okay, do y'all have any other questions? <laughs> because I really would like y'all to, to look at our display, because we really brought a good cross section of items for y'all to, to really appreciate. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much.